office, along with these other television providers, giving you a front row seat to democracy. Next, the Helsinki Commission hears from former NATO Supreme Commander General Wesley Clark on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The Helsinki Commission includes nine senators, nine House members, and one member each from the State, Commerce, and Defense Departments. This runs just under an hour. We gather today at a time of great peril and sorrow. The armies of the Russian Federation have plunged into the de this democratic country of Ukraine, raining destruction across that once flourishing land and threatening its very existence. Having assembled an enormous war machine of nearly 200,000 troops and vast quantities of armor and heavy weaponry, few countries on earth could have been expected to, to be able to withstand such an onslaught. However, four weeks into the Kremlin's neo-colonial campaign, Ukraine and its courageous people are still standing. Despite every material military advantage Russian forces have been stymied by Ukraine's defenders. The Ukrainian Air Force and air defenses, widely expected to have been destroyed in the war's early days, continue to bring down Russian fighters and helicopters. Ukrainian special forces have launched daring raids behind enemy lines, crippling supply trains and destroying advancing armor and military equipment. Ukrainian regular troops and territorial defenders, some of whom were grocers and farmers and computer programmers just weeks ago, battle for every inch of their homeland. And Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has rallied the world with his bravery and honor in the face of the Kremlin's wanton destruction. Frustrated by the Ukrainian people's dogged resistance, Russian forces have increasingly targeted Ukrainian civilians themselves. The blasted hulks of Kharkiv's once handsome boulevards, the shattered and starving innocents in Mariupol, fleeing families murdered in their cars, a bombed out maternity hospital, a blasted drama theater where innocents took refuge, marked children for every Russian pilot to see. We see in Ukraine a familiar and awful strategy that is a trademark of the Russian way of war in Chechnya, in Georgia, in Syria, entire villages wiped out, great cities reduced to rubble, and schools, hospitals, shelters, and homes deliberately and systematically targeted. Earlier this week, in an address to Congress, President Zelensky thanked the United States and the world for the help Ukraine has received, but challenged us all to do more. He repeated calls for a no-fly zone to close the skies over Ukraine, but also for more advanced air defenses, tactical aviation, and new and compounding sanctions. This brings us to our event today. How can we do more? While the prospects for a U.S. or NATO-enforced no-fly zone were initially dismissed, the idea has gained fresh traction in Congress and around the world, as Russian military atrocities have become increasingly impossible to ignore, and the ensuing humanitarian catastrophe has deepened with a near-term specter of far worse to come. And at least three former NATO Supreme Allied Commanders of Europe, including one of our distinguished guests today, have come out in support of some kind of a no-fly zone. The arguments for one aren't triumphalist or made lightly, but respond to the growing boldness of Russian aggression, the strategic imperative for pre preserving Ukrainian sovereignty, and the scale of the atrocities that Russian forces are persecuting with gross abandon. At the same time, its best proponents do not downplay the risks. Enforcing a no-fly zone would be an act of war, in the defense of an aggressive sovereign country, to be sure, but a sharp escalation of the least. Such scenarios could contribute to an escalation spiral, dead American servicemen, and may not even sufficiently help Ukraine win. Meanwhile, some say it could cross a line with the Kremlin that makes the specter of Russian use of weapons of mass destruction all the likelier. Doing more also goes beyond no-fly zones, too. Medium and long-range air defense systems, fresh batches of unmanned combat aerial vehicles and their munitions, offensive platforms to help Ukraine regain their homeland, and even food and fuel. What can we spare? What can we do? What is desirable and what is possible? To that end, I'm 
so pleased to be joined by a truly world-class panel of experts to discuss Ukraine's critical needs during this critical time. However, before I introduce our guests, I want to offer the floor to our House co-chairman, Representative Steve Cohen, who I believe may have joined us today. Yes, I am. Chairman Cohen? Thank you. Thank you. I think I'm there. And I don't have my camera set up. I'll pull myself back. I'll be okay. I want to thank the panelists for all being with us. General Clark, I've known since Memphis days and over at AutoZone Park where he was my choice for President of the United States. He'd have made a good one. Uh, thank you for being with us and for your service to our country. Uh, I've been following all this very closely, and I have no military background at all, so I look forward to your remarks. But I would like to know this from this perspective. I have supported the idea of giving Ukraine the Polish airplanes. Now, that's that's got to get Poland into it, how you do it, and where they come from, and all that stuff. Uh, the concern, I, and I understand the no-fly zone would, would, would end up Third World War and all that, fine, too far. But if... And, and I understand the military arguments, oh, it's better to have these kind of drones or these kind of anti-aircraft weapons, and it's much better, and the planes are big, and they could be hit, and they could be... Zelensky wants them. Obviously, the Ukrainian army wants them. And the Ukrainian army has proven to be pretty damn good. And knowing what they can do with their equipment, they still got planes, and they fly them, and they do, do whatever they can do with them, and they want more planes. My question to you all, particularly General Clark, is... Why not let them hack the planes if there's a way to facilitate it? If it's not through Poland, it's through Slovakia or it's through Romania, whoever has those planes. They think they, that they're, they're beneficial. Give them to them. They are being killed every single day. And I'm sure if they had those planes, they would knock out some of those tanks. They can maybe, uh, as a, in a defensive way, in a defensive way, they might be able to fight some of the planes coming in. I don't know about the plane-to-plane -plane warfare. But could you address that the harm that could happen? I don't think that's going to get us into World War III if, if we facilitate the planes. With that, thank you for being with us. I look forward to learning from you. Thank you, Co-Chairman. Uh, and, and now I'd like to quickly introduce our guests. Our, our first guest hardly needs any introduction at all, General Wesley Clark, who is among the most decorated and respected military leaders in the history of the United States. He's currently a senior fellow at the UCLA Burkle Center for International Relations and the founder of Renew America Together. General Clark retired as a four-star general after 38 years in the U.S. Army, having served his last assignments as commander of U.S. Southern Command and then as commander of U.S. European Command and Supreme Allied Commander Europe. He graduated first in his class at West Point and completed degrees in philosophy, politics, and economics at Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar. General Clark also played an influential role in the Dayton peace process in Bosnia, where he helped write and negotiate significant portions of the 1995 Dayton Peace Agreement. In his final assignment as Supreme Allied Commander Europe, he led NATO forces to victory in Operation Allied Force, a 78-day air campaign backed by a ground invasion, planning, and a diplomatic process, which saved 1.5 million Albanians from ethnic cleansing. He's also an old friend to the Helsinki Commission, having testified before a commission hearing in June 2000 on Bosnia's future, under the Dayton Agreement. General Clark, the floor is yours. This morning. Thank you very much, Congressman, uh, for those kind words. Uh, Michael, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify here. It's an honor for me to be in front of you. Can you hear me and see me okay? Okay. Yes, sir. I'm in an automobile. I apologize. It's it's not the right setting, um, but it is what it is. Um, first of all, to address the congressman's concerns about the aircraft, um, the no-fly zone is a straw man. It's put up there to avoid serious discussion about how to use air power. There's nothing wrong with giving, in my view, with transferring those uh, aircraft into Ukraine. Now, there are some people who say they won't make a difference. Some people say they're not pliable. Some people say they're not in good condition. Uh, all that may be true. Uh, but the Ukrainians have about 50 combat aircraft. They're using them very carefully. They're up against some 200 Russian sorties a day. They need help. Uh, and if they want those aircraft and they say they'll help, I'm all in favor of getting them in there. That's just my personal military opinion based on 
25 years, 27 years of experience working with Russians, starting with my my first uh, uh, experience uh, in the post-war Cold War era. I was the uh, I led the first U.S.-Russian joint military staff talks in 1994 in Moscow. So I've had close contact with them during the time I was NATO commander. Before that, on the joint staff, and I followed it very closely since. Those aircraft, uh, in my view, should be transferred. Um, as far as doing more, um, I was in favor of not declaring a no-fly zone necessarily, but put the onus on on the Russians. That's that is Ukrainian airspace. If they invite us in, why shouldn't we go in? If the Russians want to confront NATO, that's their problem, not our problem. But we've somehow accepted this line of argument that it would be our problem if we did something. So we're on the one hand defending a rules-based international order, but on the other hand, not following our own legal construct. This is an independent state that's been invaded. Okay, well, that's that's the recommendation I would have given had I been in uniform. Uh, I'm sure people have given it. It hasn't been accepted, but that's my personal view, and I'll stand by it. In terms of a humanitarian airlift, maybe something like this could be done. During the Berlin crisis of 1948, we flew aircraft in to Berlin with uh, humanitarian supplies. They were not shot down. Um, we need to we perhaps do the same thing now. We have to mark those aircraft, paint the wings white or something like this, use the deconfliction line with Moscow to tell them they're coming. I'd like to do it with UN approval. I don't know why the UN can't approve it. If we can't get a Security Council resolution, go on a, um, on a, a general assembly resolution, even the vote that's already been taken. Uh, it doesn't have to be only the United States. We could form a coalition of the willing. We might have to accompany this with ground convoys. Actually, the Russians are past masters at this. They did this in 2014, 2015, with these columns of 200, 300 white painted trucks that they insisted were humanitarian aid, bringing into the Donbass region when we knew they very well they weren't. But we would be bringing in humanitarian aid. I think you've got to do both because you've got to have an airfield you can land and you've got to be able to distribute the humanitarian aid. You can't do it with, without some protection. So you've got to go in with at least UN Chapter 6 Self-Defense Authority, maybe Chapter 6 Plus, as we used in Bosnia before we put the NATO force in, so that uh, you'll have some people in there with weapons. They can protect themselves if attacked. They have the right to self-defense. They won't do aggressive operations. Could you get a lead nation? Yes, I think Ireland could do this. I also think Australia could do this. Uh, and uh, if we were to assign uh, some airlift to them, paint the wings white, yes, uh, we could fly that in in C-130s or something like this. Could you do something like this? Yes. Why would you do something like this? For humanitarian relief, but also because it breaks the tempo of escalation, which is underway. There's only two outcomes of this possible, and both are bad right now. One outcome is the Ukrainians are quickly uh, defeated. Three, four weeks from now, no food. We see Kyiv treated like Mariupol. A civilization is destroyed. There's 10 million refugees at this point, uh, and the bombs are falling uh, on Lviv as well. And um, the brave talk about an insurrection and treating Ukraine like Afghanistan, it won't hold. Or the other that the Ukrainians are given the assistance they need. They push the Russians, Russians back and Putin is frustrated and decides his best course is to escalate. He's already doing this. He's um, got a contract with Bashar Assad to bring 40,000 Syrians in. They're experts in the use of chemical weapons. His uh, intelligence people are scouring Africa to bring African troops in. Now to be truthful, some of these people really are only coming in to Belarus so they can try to escape and get, get uh, you know, sanctuary in Europe. But some of them will fight, and especially the Syrian troops, it's a very dangerous escalation. Um, at some point, he's going to strike into NATO territory with his missiles because we're going to continue to provide assistance. There's a fallacy here that somehow NATO inaction will translate into Putin's refusal to escalate. This is a logical fallacy. Putin will escalate as necessary to obtain his objectives. So I'm trying to find a third course of action. 
between Ukrainian defeat and Russian escalation, which is to provide the fire break of a humanitarian rescue mission assigned in to various locations that puts a fire break into the fighting that could lead to a ceasefire that could lead eventually to, coupled with the sanctions, a Russian pullback and withdrawal. One thing I learned from my experience in the, in the Balkans uh, from Richard Holbrook, he said, you got to stop the killing. If you stop the killing, let the diplomats argue. That's their job. They like it. But stop the killing. In this case, this is a humanitarian travesty. And I find myself in this odd position as a former NATO commander and a strong supporter of the rules-based international order. And then watching on every, every day on CNN and hearing from friends in Ukraine that we can't defend the rules-based order because Putin is threatening us with a nuclear weapon. If that's the case, what's to stop any other tyrant with a nuclear weapon from threatening us and, and doing what they wish? So we have to find our way through this. And I believe that, that, that using the United Nations as best possible or a coalition of the willing or even the Helsinki Commission and bringing in lead nations who are non-NATO and establishing humanitarian corridors is an important fire break in this. I want to just conclude by, by saying one thing, and especially um, to, our, to co-chairman Cohen. I've watched Vladimir Putin at work for over 20 years. I do business, been often in Ukraine, went there right after Maidan. Um, this is a long-term plan conceived by Vladimir Putin. I hear a lot of wishful thinking about, about negotiations and so forth. This is no mistake on Putin's part. And the latest speech, which some are saying, oh, shows Putin's in trouble. That doesn't show Putin's in trouble. What that shows is he's doubling down. He's doing now a purge the way Stalin did the purge in 1938 to prepare um, the home front for World War II. That's what this is about. And so we've got serious problems ahead with Vladimir Putin. There should be no wishful thinking that this is going to go away. We'll stabilize Ukraine, and then we can turn our focus back to China. This is not that kind of a problem. But I do think it's very important that we do everything we can to assist the people of Ukraine. And through humanitarian efforts, if we can put a fire break in, if we can slow down the pace of the battle, maybe there's a chance of heading off what looks to be an awful conflict looming in the near future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. If I can interject here just one second, General. Oh. We had a hearing yesterday with the three chairs of the foreign relations uh, committees of, of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. And they all said exactly what you're saying. We're nowhere near any kind of a peace agreement. Sometimes the news, CNN, they're getting closer, they're closer, they're this horse manure. And when you see that uh, uh, Russian boat ship ship going through the Japanese Straits with all that weaponry. That takes yep. a long time to get there. They're not sending that there with the idea that they're getting close to the end of this thing. Putin's a hard head. He wants to he wants because of Mednikov being put in house arrest, because of the uh, uh, Russian Orthodox Church not having Kiev, and because of him and Peter the Great. He's not gonna stop until he's destroyed that country and he wants and, and killed Zelensky. Yes, sir. You're I believe that too, and I believe that he won't stop there. He wants the Balkans back. Right. He wants the Baltics back. He wants his part of Europe back. Every time I met with Russian generals after the fall of the Berlin Wall and so forth, they always said, you're in our part of Europe. These are our countries. You're coming in here. When, when, when are your NATO ships going to be in our port of Riga? So it's not your port. But of course, they don't believe that. So this is not just Putin. He's speaking on behalf of a large group of the Russian uh, power ministries. And uh, this is a well-conceived, long-term plan. He thinks he's found a hole in the U.S. strategy of deterrence. That is to say that <clears throat> we believe deterrence could stop conflict. He believes he can use nuclear weapons to stop our intervention when he attacks. This is a hole, a, a, a logical policy hole and somehow we have to think this thing through on the fly because the same problem will affect us 
if we're talking about China and Taiwan, or even South Korea and North Korea, now that North Korea is building an ICBM to strike us. And certainly the same with Iran. So we have to recognize the full dimensions of the challenge that are facing us. This is not gonna go away with Ukraine. Yes, he wants to crush it, but it's a far deeper problem than that. He wants to overturn the 75 years of post-World War II international structure, including, of course, the Helsinki Commission, and have it his way. His way is the 19th century way of autocrats cutting up the world into their spheres of influence and then uh, launching wars to expand their spheres of influence. And uh, that is the historic Russian way. And that's what Vladimir Putin represents. And it's no fluke. And it's no rant from a deranged mind. And it's not something that's going to be easily dissuaded. This is what he's been building for, for, for most of his 20 years in office, I would say. So I think we've got a real deep challenge here. Let me ask one more question, and I'm going to go on mute for a long time. Uh, his hypersonic weapons, missiles, how are, are, do we have a, a, any ability to, to stop them, inter, intercept them, or, or is that, is that a, a threat that is significant to our, to our security? It is significant to our security because right now we don't have a means of intercepting them. And, you know, we've worked our Patriot system to do a, uh, a hit-to-kill intercept, and it calculates ballistic trajectories. And these weapons are coming in not as fast as an ICBM would come in. An ICBM comes in two to three times faster than a hypersonic. But the hypersonic is coming in in its own trajectory, and it's, it's maneuverable as it comes in. So it could well avoid a hit-to-kill Patriot Pac-3 enhanced warhead. This is a challenge, but um, it's a conventional challenge. Uh, a nuclear weapon is still a nuclear weapon. And uh, if nuclear weapons, if it goes to nuclear weapons, those hypersonics are no different than any other nuclear weapon. Nuclear weapons get through, nuclear weapons will kill. So uh, Vladimir Putin uh, thinks he has some kind of a strategic advantage over us. A congressman, and I would, let me, let me just put this in context. In 1962, the reason the Bay of Pigs didn't go well for Khrushchev was because he realized and the Russians realized at the time that the U.S. had strategic nuclear superiority. We had escalation dominance potential over anything that happened in Cuba. He knew it, he pulled back, and he was eventually overthrown. Today, we don't have strategic nuclear superiority. We are at, at basically minimum assured deterrence. And um, we don't have the hypersonics. We don't have the tactical nuclear weapons that Russia has. But we do have a deterrent force. And I believe that deterrence is, is sufficient. But you cannot handle the challenge of Putin's interpretation of deterrence without paying special attention to the risks involved. And this is where we're, we're wrestling with the problem. We know there are risks. The question is, how do we deal with those risks? And these risks are profound. Putin is stressing the system, but if we don't deal with the risks here, the risks will be much more difficult in defending NATO or defending Taiwan. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, General Clark. I, I'd like to quickly uh, recognize um, our House Ranking Member, Joe Wilson, uh, who's joined us as well. Uh, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much. And General Clark, thank you so much for your uh, input and, and insight. Uh, and I want you to be aware uh, how bipartisan really uh, things are today uh, with the leadership of uh, Co-Chair Steve Cohen and others uh, that we do recognize um, and, and are taking every step uh, and, and what you said is, um, is, is uh, really disturbing. Uh, indeed, this is a plan that uh, Putin announced in 2007. Uh, but what you just said um, uh, is also a death sentence for uh, the Republic of Georgia, a death sentence immediately for the Republic of Moldova. Uh, and so that makes it so much more important uh, that Republicans and Democrats work together to uh, help the people of Ukraine succeed. And, and we can. And then every effort, uh, I 
want to back up um, Congressman Cohen uh, to uh, destabilize our, uh, Russia itself, uh, because the Russian people I've met um, are, are, are not uh, authoritarians. And then I, I want to put in the context, too. Uh, General, I believe that we're in a worldwide war between uh, authoritarians and uh, uh, democracies. And uh, a way to express this, and I have to give credit to uh, Senator Lindsey Graham, uh, when you say that, um, it, it goes over people's heads. Uh, but it's a uh, conflict between uh, rule of law and rule by gun. And, uh, and you hit it on the head. Uh, you mentioned uh, the CCP and uh, Taiwan. Uh, we also see uh, truly Iran um, with their uh, proxies, the Houthis, uh, to um, go after our allies, Saudi Arabia and uh, UAE. And we're not standing with them like we should. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and we should understand uh, Iran is perfectly clear uh, as they chant in the parliament, death to Israel, death to America. That's what they mean. And, I, I, and I'm really concerned that uh, over and over, uh, we see uh, efforts being made like the Iran deal that are uh, insane that Russia would be negotiating on the part of the United States. Uh, it, to me, it's suicidal for Israel and America. But hey, thank you for your insight. And I, I, I really look forward to a continued bipartisan effort to protect um, the people of Ukraine first, and then America, obviously, next. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. I want to introduce our second distinguished guest, Dr. Stacy Pettyjohn, who is a senior fellow and director of the defense program at the Center for New American Security. At CNS, Dr. Pettyjohn focuses on defense strategy, posture, force planning, force presentation, security cooperation, and wargaming. Prior to joining CNS, Dr. Pettyjohn spent over 10 years at the Rand Corporation as a political scientist. Between 2019 and 2021, she was the director of the Strategy and Doctrine Program in Project Air Force. From 2014 to 2020, she served as the co-director of the Center for Gaming. Previously, she was a research fellow at the Brookings Institution, a Peace Scholar at the United States Institute of Peace, and a Tapir Fellow at the Rand Corporation. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Pettyjohn. The floor is yours. Thanks for the opportunity to be here today. As Russia's brutal attacks on Ukraine are escalating and becoming more indiscriminate, there's a natural impulse to want to do something to help and protect the innocent Ukrainians. Um, but some of the most prominent options that are being debated, including Ukrainian President Zelensky's uh, humanitarian no-fly zone or General Clark's humanitarian corridors, are likely to be either escalatory, ineffective, or both. Instead, the United States and NATO should focus on getting useful military tools into the hands of the Ukrainians that they can immediately employ to change the balance on the battlefield. So there are three main arguments that I would make against a no-fly zone or a humanitarian corridor, and um, I'll treat the two similarly, though there are uh, some, some differences. The first one is the risk of escalation. And I know Dr. Kronig is going to talk about uh, the nuclear risks, so I'm only going to briefly touch upon this. But uh, President Putin explicitly warned uh, that he would consider using nuclear weapons if a country intervened on the side of Ukraine in this war or if they attacked Russia. A no-fly zone or humanitarian corridors is likely to lead us to cross both of those red lines. Um, and while one might believe that this is simply bluster on the part of Russia, I think it's very reckless to call this bluff, uh, given the terrible consequences of nuclear use. Moreover, um, a no-fly zone or humanitarian corridors would uh, certainly result in direct American-Russian combat at the conventional level, um, at which the United States and NATO should certainly seek to avoid. So when you, you look at the terms that are being used right now, no-fly zone, humanitarian corridor, they sound rather innocuous and defensive, but in reality, they require combat operations. Um, and that entail shooting down any violators of the no-fly zone, Russian uh, fighter jets, drones, helicopters that might encroach on the defended airspace. They also would require uh, neutralizing, suppressing, or destroying Russia's ground-based air defenses. 
And Russia has an extensive network of air defenses that are accompanying its invasion force in Ukraine. It also has a number of long-range surface-to-air missiles located in Belarus and Russia. And if the United States does not uh, obtain air superiority for beginning before beginning uh, its operations, it's going to have to assume tremendous risk that these Russian forces don't uh, turn on and actually shoot down any of the American aircraft that would be patrolling the skies. Um, and so this, this is one part of the escalatory risk. We've seen in the past with no-fly zones over Bosnia that uh, American aircraft have been shot down in F-16 by a Bosnian Serb surface-to-air missile, and one that's older than the ones that Russia has now. The second argument against a no-fly zone is that it's not going to significantly improve the plight of the Ukrainians and would likely lead to more expensive, expansive American combat operations. So when you look at the different examples of no-fly zones over Iraq, over Bosnia, over Libya, um, they haven't stayed limited because they haven't worked. Um, they haven't protected civilians. Some of the worst atrocities in Bosnia occurred after a no-fly zone had been established. And in the end, all of these conflicts ended up escalating to large air campaigns and uh, more extensive combat operations because that was the only way of truly protecting the people on the ground. And I believe that is uh, true today in Ukraine and something that we want to avoid. Russian aircraft have not posed the greatest threat to the Ukrainians. They've been used rather in a limited fashion and pretty ineffectively because of Ukraine's uh, air defenses, which have been um, quite effective at keeping them at bay. So I think this is a situation where an imprecision in terms sometimes creates problems. We say bombardment, but that often means a lot of different things coming from different uh, sources. That can be artillery on the ground, rockets on the ground. It can be surface-to-surface -surface missiles, which are also ground-based ballistic or cruise missiles. And then it can be actual aircraft dropping bombs. The last one has occurred the least frequently, and um, a no-fly zone wouldn't be able to address the ground-based threats unless it was expanded into just attacking Russian ground forces. Um, finally, the my the last reason that I think a no-fly zone should be avoided or humanitarian corridors is that um, it would be really challenging and it might not actually be successful. Um, the United States and NATO have the best air forces in the world. I believe that. I've seen it. I know it to be true. But uh, air defenses have proven to be very challenging to find, especially mobile ones that are layered and networked the way that Russia's are. Um, in the uh, air war against uh, Kosovo that General Clark led, the Air Force never actually achieved air superiority, according to a RAND study. And uh, the challenge that they would face today in Ukraine over Russia is much greater. You'd need to have aircraft um, in the air at all times with 24-7 combat air patrols to be able to uh, respond quickly to any threats that are detected. That's going to require several rings of fighter jets and also intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance aircraft, uh, command and control aircraft, and tankers to support them. So there are going to be a lot of assets that need to be devoted to it. And then um, simply, it's difficult to find ground-based air defenses. They're small, and if they don't emit, um, uh, which is what happened in Kosovo, uh, they could remain a threat and um, continue to shoot down American or NATO aircraft that were patrolling the skies. Given all these challenges with the no-fly zone, a better uh, option is arming the courageous Ukrainians who are fighting back. But it's really important that we send the right capabilities that they can effectively employ immediately. We don't really have time to waste training them and that these systems are survivable and sustainable. So we uh, talked briefly about the older MiGs that Poland had offered. I don't see that as a bad option, but I don't see it as the best option either. I don't view it as hugely escalatory, though those systems are ones that are more vulnerable to Russian attacks because they're larger. Um, and they're old aircraft, so sustaining them is going to be difficult and um, challenging. They require runways, um, and I think the Polish MiGs have been upgraded in a way that uh, makes them dissimilar to the ones that the Ukrainian Air Force already operates.
So instead of uh, manned aircraft, I think a better option is a layered system of mobile, short, um, medium, and long-range air defenses. We've been sending a ton of short-range air defenses, the um, manned portable systems like Stingers, which is great. They've been very effective at shooting down Russian um, aircraft, but that's only because the threat of the longer-range longer range systems remain. Um, uh, Russian air forces are having to fly lower, which puts them within range of the man pads um, that are actually causing a lot of the damage. So we need to make sure that uh, Ukraine's layered air defense network remains intact and ideally try to find it some Russian made systems that um, can uh, reinforce it. To complement that, the international community should continue to provide precision standoff weapons that can attract Russian forces from range such as guided anti-tank weapons like the Javelin and precision strike capabilities like uh, drones. So the Turkish-made drones have been very effective. The United States just provided switchblade. These are all great assets that when coupled um, with the air defenses have proven to be very effective on other battlefields like in Armenia and Azerbaijan and Libya. Um, in addition, the U.S. had previously provided the Ukrainians with counter-battery radars, um, the, which could be really helpful in uh, targeting these drones, and they should make sure that they have spare parts and potentially consider providing um, additional ones to them. So my, my bottom line is the international community should help Ukraine but not by following the post-Cold War playbook of implementing a no-fly zone. This course of action has only been tried against much less capable adversaries and by itself has not proven to be an effective way of protecting vulnerable populations. Against Russia, a no-fly zone would be even more difficult to implement and may not succeed. Um, it is, however, guaranteed to be escalatory and to lead to direct American or NATO uh, combat with Russia. And it raises the potential for limited or even more extensive than that nuclear loot use, which is something that I never want to see in my lifetime. Instead of pursuing a no-fly zone, the international community should focus on providing Ukraine with weapons that they can immediately use and sustain, including short, medium, and long-range air defenses, counter-battery radars, drones, and precision-guided munitions. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Pettyjohn. Our third distinguished guest is Dr. Matthew Kronig, who is director of the Scowcroft Strategy Initiative at the Atlantic Council and a professor of government at Georgetown University. At the Atlantic Council, Dr. Kronig leads the Scowcroft Center's Global Strategy Unit and supports the director in managing a bipartisan team of over 40 resident staff and an extensive network of non-resident experts. His research focuses on U.S. national security policy, great power competition with China and Russia, and strategic deterrence and weapons non-proliferation. Dr. Kronick has served in several positions in the U.S. Department of Defense and the intelligence community in multiple administrations, including in the Office of the Secretary of Defense and the CIA's Strategic Assessment Group. Thank you for, for your participation, and the floor is yours. Great. Well, thank you very much uh, for the introduction and for the invitation to be here today. Uh, thank you uh, to the co-chairman and, and the congressman for um, the opportunity. Uh, I was asked today to focus uh, specifically on the risk of um, nuclear escalation. Nuclear strategy has been uh, one of my main areas of focus over the past uh, two decades. Uh, and I'm going to explain today that uh, I think there is a, a real risk that Putin could use nuclear weapons in the war in Ukraine. Um, but at the same time, uh, explain that I think the Biden administration and NATO can dial up their support, their military support to Ukraine without um, increasing uh, the risk of nuclear war. So that might sound uh, contradictory, so let me explain. Uh, first, I, I think it's important to understand that Putin doesn't want a nuclear war either. Um, getting into a, a nuclear war, getting into a NATO-Russia war doesn't serve Putin's uh, interest. He, he wants to avoid that. Uh, and we have seen him in, in past crises um, back down uh, when it looked like things were uh, escalating. So we have to remember that this is two-sided. It's not only the West that's uh, afraid of escalation, it's also uh, Putin. Uh, so that does mean that we can um, dial up uh, military assistance uh, without uh, greatly increasing uh, the risk of nuclear escalation. I think it's um, unlikely uh, that if we provide some of these military capabilities we've talked about, uh, the, the MiGs, the uh, chairman asked about 
um, the uh, more advanced air defenses that have been mentioned, uh, anti-ship missiles is a possibility that people have mentioned. Uh, it, it's hard for me to see how that uh, turns into a direct um, NATO-Russia war or uh, results in nuclear escalation. Uh, when it comes to no-fly zones or humanitarian corridors, I, I think I might split the difference between Dr. Petitjean and, and General Clark. Um, I do think a no-fly zone uh, does run a, a real risk of escalation. Doing that right would mean shooting down uh, Russian planes. That, that would mean um, uh, direct NATO-Russia war. Uh, but I do I think something like a humanitarian corridor uh, could work, uh, uh, supported by ground convoys. And as an example, we have the example in uh, 2008 when George Bush uh, sent uh, Air Force planes and a Navy warship to Georgia on a humanitarian mission as Putin was invading. And, and Putin stopped short of Tbilisi. And some well-placed experts think that that was key. It was uh, the United States saying, get out of the way, we're coming, uh, that caused Putin to stop short. So I think something similar could work here if we sent in a humanitarian mission into the western part of Ukraine uh, and um, declared this a humanitarian zone. Uh, I think it would have the benefit of providing humanitarian relief. I think it would have the strategic benefit of uh, carving out a western uh, zone in Ukraine that um, uh, to prevent uh, Putin from taking over the entire country. Um, and then I, I do think that uh, Putin uh, would order his military forces to stay clear of that area because, uh, again, I don't think Putin wants to turn this into a direct uh, Russia-NATO war. Um, so that's the first point. I do think we can dial up assistance without um, increasing the risk. Second point, I do think there's a real risk of um, nuclear use. Uh, and this is um, because I do think that Putin is, is already uh, employing his so-called escalate to de-escalate doctrine. And at its essence, this, this doctrine is essentially to uh, use Russian nuclear weapons to offset the conventional and economic advantages uh, of NATO and the United States. Uh, so we've already seen him uh, make nuclear threats, uh, both in 2014 and in this crisis, uh, essentially saying, uh, you know, stay away or else things could escalate to nuclear uh, uh, catastrophe. Uh, but then the, the next part of the strategy is, depending on the circumstances, to follow through with um, limited nuclear strikes. And depending on how the war develops, I think that is a possibility. Uh, for example, if uh, Ukraine succeeds in, in winning this war with Western support, pushing Russian forces out of the country, uh, and Putin looks uh, set to uh, suffer an embarrassing military defeat, uh, he's wondering about his uh, control at home, uh, even the future of his uh, life. I, I think to Putin using a nuclear weapon and trying to force uh, Ukraine and the West to back down and sue for peace on terms favorable to Moscow uh, would seem more attractive than, than simply accepting defeat. Uh, so I think there's a risk. Um, third point, if that's correct, it means that the current strategy, uh, the current administration strategy also runs a risk of nuclear war. Uh, if providing javelins and stingers helps Ukraine to win this war, Putin is facing a, a devastating defeat, uh, he might find nuclear escalation attractive. So I think there's nothing magic between a line uh, between javelins and, and MiGs where javelins are, are not escalatory and MiGs, um, and MiGs um, are. Um, so then uh, fourth point, how do we deter uh, Putin from using nuclear weapons? Uh, and it's a very difficult uh, challenge. Uh, you know, the uh, most straightforward way to do this would be to draw a kind of red line and say that if Putin uses nuclear weapons or uses chemical weapons, uh, the United States or NATO uh, and NATO would get involved in this war, uh, that we're planning to stay out. But if uh, Putin used nuclear weapons, this would be a game changer uh, for us. Um, but I don't know that that's uh, credible, and I don't know that the Biden administration uh, would, would want to set or follow through on that red line. Uh, it does seem like President Biden is uh, determined to uh, stay out of the conflict uh, and I don't know that that changes even if Putin uses nuclear weapons. Uh, so given uh, that, uh, I think the, the best option may be if Putin uses nuclear weapons uh, to essentially uh, follow through on, on our same, uh, the same strategy, uh, maybe dial it up a, a little bit, but provide support to the Ukrainians, sanctions, uh, reinforce NATO's uh, eastern flank, uh, and continue to fight through uh, and win uh, the conflict. Um, because um, a, a final point, concluding point, uh, avoiding escalation can't be our, our foremost objective uh, in this conflict. Uh, if it's our, our foremost objective, uh, we essentially tell Putin, threaten nuclear weapons and, and you can do anything uh, you want. Uh, instead, our objective is to help the Ukrainians defend themselves, to defend NATO, defend the rules-based system, 
uh, and doing that does require uh, running uh, some risks of escalation. So uh, thank you very much. Look forward to, to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Kronig, for providing your perspective, and, and thank you to Dr. Pettyjohn and General Clark for their uh, interesting and, and forthcoming analyses. Before we move to the off-record portion of the event, I, I wanted to offer our commission leadership, Co-Chairman Cohen and Ranking Member Wilson, the opportunity to make a closing statement or ask a public question of our guests. Mr. Wilson, if you would uh, indulge me, of course, I have your, your nice pictures here. Thank you, thank you, thank you again for mm -hmm. the recent journey. Uh, Ms. Pettyjohn and, and Mr. Koenig, if you can explain to me or tell me, I mean, I understand that the reasons why people say that the Polish planes might not be effective, they're big, they'd be shot down, uh, that they, other any aircraft uh, uh, platforms are better, uh, and, and and all. Why does Zelensky and his obviously his military continue to want them? If they want them and they've made that their second desire beyond the no fly, which is a no go, why would they want them if, if they are not as effective as these other deterrent uh, weapon systems? And if they are so vulnerable to being shot down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I would just uh, guessing, I don't know what they're thinking, but um, I think they're looking for any and all help that they can receive. And um, they and Ukraine, right, you know, for very good reasons, is seeking to uh, draw in other countries as much as it can because it knows it want it needs to offset its weakness against Russia. So this is one way to do so. I don't think the MiGs are particularly escalatory. It's more that they're not going to do much. And um, the fact that they put Ukrainian pilots at risk when unmanned systems don't, and the fact that I don't think they'll be flying for very long because of sustainment challenges. But um, I'm not uh, terribly opposed to that idea. Uh Chairman, I, I think my instincts on this are, are similar to yours and uh, General Clark. Um, I, I think that um, if the Ukrainians want them, we should uh, find a way to get them uh, there. Um, you know, we can look back to uh, previous debates. At the beginning of this war, there were experts writing that uh, we shouldn't provide the Ukrainians uh, really any arms because uh, they, they didn't really stand a chance. It wouldn't be effective. And I think the Ukrainians have uh, surprised us. Uh, so if they want these uh, capabilities, I, I think we should uh, uh, find a way to get them there. Uh, maybe they'll surprise us, and, and I do think we can do it without uh, greatly increasing the risk of escalation with Russia. Thank each of you. Appreciate it. It's just you know, just to, to I, I don't think I'm going beyond maybe going beyond. But some of our top military folks told us early on that Russia would take Kiev in 24 to 48 hours, so they weren't so aware of what Ukraine could do. Ranking Member Wilson. Include uh, for uh, uh, everyone, uh, I, I hope you see uh, indeed how bipartisan, uh, I, hey, Putin has done something that I didn't think could be done, and that is to have Joe Wilson and Steve Cohen like this, okay? And uh, but we're, this is symbolic. And and then hey, it's so inspiring to me uh, to see uh, NATO, no division, uh, a change of policy uh, by Germany. I mean, they they were worse than equivocating when this began. All right, you remember they were not going to let Estonia provide javelin missiles to even cross German territory. Okay, uh, and some of us still remember when it was East and West Germany. They should understand that maybe uh, strength, uh, peace through strength works, and it does bring down walls. Uh, and then to see the European Union. I'm the co-chair of the uh, EU caucus, and again, another, I don't want to ruin his reputation, but Democrat I work with, uh, Brendan Byrne. Uh, the e uh, we're the co-chairs of the EU caucus. Uh, we were delighted to find out, uh, General Clark, that they actually uh, are providing military equipment to uh, Ukraine. Uh, both of us did not know the EU had military equipment. Uh, and, but it's very significant that you have the 21 countries of uh, NATO, 27 countries of EU. Uh, and, and then, again, the solidarity that we need to keep uh, within the United States. Uh, and so, uh, and in particular, Dr. Koenig, 
um, you you could you uh, you look too young to have been 20 years studying uh, nuclear um, uh, 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 catastrophe, uh, but sadly, your day has come. Uh, we are so close, uh, and I uh, um and uh, and and just everything that's we done, and then uh, Dr. Pettyjohn, I uh, I agree about the no-fly zone, but everything that could possibly be done. Uh, to provide equipment, and and I, all we hear is excuses. Um, we have uh, our allies, uh, uh, so Slovenia, Slovakia, Bulgaria, with S three hundred systems, and, and and they're reluctant to move them into Ukraine because there's no backfill. Well, the, hey, that's insane. Uh, we should be providing immediate backfill. We we're not using all of our um, uh, missile defense systems, uh, and then we've seen the success to protect the people uh, of Israel. Thank God with the Iron Dome, uh, Patriot Missile Systems. Uh, these all should be provided. And uh, and then uh, on another angle, uh, that uh, as a 31-year military veteran myself, um, to actually see, and, and I've been to Russia a number of times. I, I truly thought Russia was going to be a modern country. I, I, I've met so many people from uh, uh, from St. Petersburg to uh, Novosibirsk, Moscow, of course, and uh, Chayabinsk, uh, Tomsk, Omsk. Uh, I've, uh, Really, uh, and the people of Russia um, uh, simply have just got to understand uh, that they're going to become international pariahs, and uh, and, uh, and that and, and that murder is being conducted in their name uh, when it's one person, Putin, as identified by the very brave newscaster that we may never hear from again. But uh, uh, something I've been trying to do on psychological warfare is that I've got uh, legislation provided. That would provide for any uh, military troop who uh, defects uh, that they would be given immediate refugee status to the United States. And if they bring over uh, equipment from the Russian uh, side to uh, provide to the Ukrainians, that they could receive up to $100,000. Uh, this is a really good return on a $10 million tank. And, um, and so I, I'm really hoping uh, to get that message out. And then I, I introduced that last week, and then I was really grateful President Zelensky uh, said that um, he wants uh, Russian troops to surrender. We, I think, uh, think alike. Uh, and then this week it occurred to me, or even late last week, wait a minute, we have uh, Russian diplomats today, particularly younger ones, uh, who um, are around the world. And uh, now they're going to be vilified everywhere they go uh, and humiliated, and they know the truth. And so I've introduced legislation um, that uh, Russian diplomats have the ability to uh, receive refugee status immediately to come to America. And then it's somewhat of a, a backhanded uh, slap, but I was in Kiev in December with uh, Congressman Ruben Galeo, uh, a Democrat. Can you believe I was there with him? And uh, he did a CNN interview, which then a member of the Russian Duma uh, called on him to be kidnapped and brought to Moscow for trial. And so uh, a backhanded compliment uh, to that member of the Duma, I have proposed that members of the Duma could receive refugee status and come to the United States. Uh, but we need to, uh, the people of Russia have just got to get the information and uh, message. And then, hey, it is being received. Um, this week, I, I, I know we're talking about people who are very knowledgeable. Uh, the thought of, the, uh, of uh, Putin saying that we need to be self-cleansing. Hey, we've heard that before. It was called Stalinist purges. Uh, and, and immediately, the head, apparently, of the National Guard uh, was uh, detained. Uh, he's, uh, his name has not been eliminated, so he's not a non-person yet. Uh, but, hey, uh, we need to be appealing to the uh, Russian people. Hey, I, I was even grateful to see uh, that a hero of all of ours, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, formerly of uh, Vienna, um, uh, currently of California. He did a, a video to the Russian people, and, of course, um, Zelensky himself did a, uh, a plea to the people of Russia. And then, hey, how more effective than having uh, Ukrainian grandmothers coming up to uh, the Russian troops and, uh, and telling them they need to go home. And then if you don't go home, here, I've got some uh, sunflower seeds for you to put in your pocket so that when you're killed and buried, the national flower of uh, Ukraine can come to life. Uh, and uh, just over and over again, um, uh, anyway, that uh, as a member of Congress, uh, working with uh, Co-Chairman Cohen, um, uh, this is a remarkable opportunity for everybody to work together for the EU. For the uh, I, I had, have zero faith in the UN, uh, and uh, uh, and but uh, with uh, uh, it's exciting to see NATO come to life. Hey, 
Germany's now going to have 2% of their um, uh, meet that goal, which uh, it is so beneficial. And so uh, just, again, however we can be working together, I look forward to working with Co-Chairman Cohen. Thank you. Thank you, Co-Chairman Cohen and Ranking Member Wilson for, for your comments and, uh, and, and wisdom. So this now concludes the public portion of our event. Uh, we thank everyone here for, for their participation. Uh, congressional staff and U.S. government personnel, uh, please hold as we transition to the closed session. C-SPAN's Washington Journal.